Здравствуйте! Это я, комиссар Бинков. Hi, it is I, комиссар Бинков. In this scenario, Russia and Turkey are at war. Nukes, morale, allies, weapon imports or outside bases are not modeled, of course. I've already talked about the air war, so that part will be skipped. If belligerents would wage war with ground troops, what options would they have? The two countries don't share a border. Going west is a non-starter, as it would step on too many important toes. Remaining options are going through weaker caucus states and performing an amphibious or air assault. But which side has a navy capable of performing such a landing? Russian Navy is larger, but it is also divided into far away fleets which would have to carry the troops and supply its ships. Majority of Russian fleet is made up of small vessels with insufficient endurance for such a high seas mission. The replenishment fleet is not large enough to provide proper support. Ocean going part of Northern, Pacific and Baltic fleets would have to operate near South Turkish coast, too far from Russia to receive meaningful air cover. Turkish planes would be well positioned to deal with a possible landing. Turkish Navy could go back and forth through Bosporus and Dardanelles and concentrate its forces. Close to its shores, it could use its numerous small boats and diesel-electric submarines effectively. Russian best assets would be its nuclear submarines. But since Turkish fleet would stick to its coast, it would be too dangerous for Russia to secure that coast with all the Turkish anti-submarine ships and helicopters. It would be a non-starter for Russia to undertake a landing from the south. Russian Black Sea Fleet would be too weak to be useful against more numerous defenders on their own, but they would enjoy Russian air supremacy, so a minor amphibious landing could be possible. Russian airborne forces, on the other hand, are amongst the largest in the world. Coupled with Air Force's transport fleet, in theory they could paradrop up to two brigades at once, and perhaps paradrop entire airborne corps within days. Such a concentration of force would be hard to fight against, but also very hard to supply. As comparison with Normandy landing shows, any force needs several times larger shipments of supplies than it has troops. With only partial air superiority, such air supply runs would face steep losses. Realistically, only a short supply stint could be pulled off. Thus, an assault would likely happen not far off the front lines. That way, it can try to meet up with the main Russian assault before it loses momentum. Turkish Navy is absolutely ill-prepared to fight Russia far away from its coasts, let alone perform a landing. Given the stronger Russian air power, air defenses and more numerous troops defending the shores, what little men Turkey could hope to send out to sea would likely not even reach the shores. Such a mission would end in a disaster, and so it would not even be attempted. Land-wise, if both sides would rush at each other, Georgian plane might see fighting first. Turkey could quickly send large part of its forces along the coastline. Russia too has that luxury, as it controls Abkhazia and South Ossetia and already has troops stationed there. Russia's ground force has a small numerical edge. Turkey has larger periodically trained reserve force, while Russia can count on more paramilitary troops. Russia has twice as many professional soldiers, though. Both sides use a variety of heavy weapon systems, both old and modern equipment. But Russian units feature more heavy weapons, and their average tank is somewhat more advanced. With all that, Turkey moving into Russia-controlled territory would be prohibitively costly. Even if Turkey could somehow attack first and push all the way through the central Georgian plain, it would still face greater Caucasus mountains. With the balance power shown so far, such a push would simply lead to unacceptably numerous casualties for Turkey. Russian army isn't well prepared for a prolonged power projection far into enemy territory, but Turkish units are even worse in that regard. Russia possesses greater aerial mobility fleet, providing them with more maneuvering options. Russia also leads in situational awareness. It has more reconnaissance platforms in space, air and on land. Another Russian edge is more air support available. Combined with vastly stronger air defenses, which would neutralize much of Turkish air support to their troops, Russia could count on more fire support in general. Especially when one counts the larger and more modern assault helicopter fleet, 
as well as land-based rocket forces. Best bet for Turkey would be sticking to more defendable region of Lesser Caucasus Mountains and keep an eye for counter-strike opportunities at overstretched Russian forces. Attacking is hard. Historically, swift and successful large-scale invasions required several-fold advantage in manpower, vast air superiority, noticeable technological edge and fairly flat terrain to succeed, oftentimes combined. Russia would not be able to count on any of those for its push into Turkish defenses. Its air superiority would not be continuous, and it would have a hard time exploiting it due to number of targets and fairly low precision of its airstrikes. Russia has more heavy weapons, but their mobility would be very much hindered by the mountainous terrain. Without great manpower edge, it would be very hard for Russia to make headway. It would seek to enlarge the front, drawing Turkish troops into Armenia as well, so it can spread out the defenders and hope for an opening. Still, the sheer numbers of Turkish troops would suit Turkey's defensive posture better. Attempting a quick breach would be prohibitively costly in casualties. The front line would be too narrow and too populated by soldiers on both sides for successful large-scale flanking maneuvers. Russia would have no choice but to very slowly wear down the defenses with sheer firepower. Successful invasions in history took weeks to cross little terrain, even with overwhelming force. Here the time frame would be stretched even further, and all the while attacking force would require more manpower and more casualties while securing new territory. Actually reaching Turkish border wouldn't make the advance any easier. The topography of northeastern Turkey is quite hilly. Russian heavy vehicles would be slow, ambushed and counter-attacked often. Russia would be fast to wear itself out under the pressure of stretched out supply lines and more numerous casualties than Turkey. Within the first year of the war, the situation would not be rosy for Turkey and equally so for Russia, even if it would breach the Turkish borders. With greater Russian casualties and relatively little territory gained, one might say the result of the war up to that point would be a marginal victory for Russia. In a prolonged war, Russia would not rush but wait for its industry and population advantage to come into force. Turkish problem in a prolonged war with no weapon imports would be its relative lack of self-sufficiency when it comes to high-tech weapon systems. Russia can produce those in larger numbers. During the second year of war, Turkish forces would erode into a somewhat poorly equipped army with a small remaining inventory of precision weapons, aircraft or modern tanks and artillery. They would still be very large in manpower though. But Russia would enjoy benefits of its larger population pool, domestic production of weapons and larger pool of ex-Soviet heavy weaponry, some of which could be repaired. Russia might see casualty ratios starting to drop while moving further inside Turkey. The terrain would still be rougher than in any large-scale invasions in recent history, and concentration of defenders would still make the invasion very slow and dangerous. It might take yet another year or more until Russia could claim it won enough territory while not losing many more troops than Turkey, and proclaim itself a winner. But it would be an extremely costly victory.